These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net, assuming I can get the website running. We will begin this podcast series way back at the beginning, not the beginning of humanity, but at the very beginning of writing in the ancient Sumeria, with the cycle of royal epics culminating in the famous Epic of Gilgamesh. Now these tales are truly ancient, dating back possibly as early as 2700 BCE, nearly 5,000 years ago, and have survived through unimaginable millennia as cuneiform on clay tablets. These earliest tales are fascinating, at least in my mind, because they reveal a deeply strange culture, but also at the same time characters who are recognizably human in the modern sense. We can at times imagine ourselves spanning this 5,000 year gulf and in the same circumstances as these people acting the exact same way. While at other times we can remember the old saying that the past is a foreign country and we can be astonished that anyone can think in quite the patterns that these people think in. The Sumerian royal epics tell the tale of Enmerkar, Lugalbanda, and Gilgamesh, the second, third, and fifth kings of the city of Uruk. Now, some of you listening may wonder where Uruk is, but you need only look at any modern map, because even 5,000 years later, the place may be gone, but the place name is still there, though slightly morphed, as the nation of Iraq. Now all three of these kings are directly descended from the gods, specifically the sun god Shemash, and are divine in their own right. We will get to the most famous of them, Gilgamesh, soon enough, but I want to stop first at his two prior kings to ease us back into both the oral storytelling tradition and to Sumerian culture. Now these stories come to us on clay tablets, but those tablets are not a cohesive story. Even beyond the fact that large chunks are simply missing or illegible, cuneiform was written mostly as notes, and I will be, as was tradition for storytellers, mostly working off these notes and employing my own poetic license to tell the story in the way it was meant to be told. But enough prelude. The four-part cycle begins with Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata possibly the oldest written account of war between humans. On the fertile plain above the Euphrates River sat the wealthy farmland of Calaba, and the gem of Calaba was the powerful city of Uruk. Now here was a city of brick that stretched from the earth all the way to the heavens, with the first monumental constructions predating even the Egyptian pyramids. But even before these mighty temples, these mighty ziggurats, before even the first known representation of the human face, before commerce was invented by the merchants here, before mining could bring precious stones down from the mountains, before the countless men and slaves had gathered in this massive city, they set the site of a holy temple to Ishtar, also called Inanna, it was around this holiest of places that the city of Uruk arose over the passage of many years and through the favor of the gods. Now, there's another place, a place lost to time, the city of Arata in the southwest mountains of modern Iran. Now here was a city blessed with gold and jewels and lapis lazuli. I'm not even really sure what lapis lazuli is, but these guys really really went for that kind of stuff. Uh, but the holy places to Ishtar and the Sumerian gods were also constructed here. Uh, Sumerian culture spread all around ancient Mesopotamia. And Arata being in the mountains with all this fantastic wealth and gold and such built these temples with tremendous artistry and tremendous beauty but this wealth and beauty was empty, and when the Lord of Arata crowned himself in Ishtar's name, he could not compare in her heart to the Lord of Uruk. Because Arata did not build for Ishtar, he built 
for his own vanity. Now, enter Enmerkar into our tale, the second king of Uruk, the son of the sun, that is to say, Shamash, also called Utu, the god of justice, morality, and truth, who is also the very sun up in the sky. Enmerkar calls the goddess Ishtar, who might be his sister, might be his great aunt, might be in some way his lover, possibly all three. But in any case, he calls to her and he says, look over there, sister. Now, wouldn't it be great if the people of Arata used some of that fantastic mineral wealth to enrich the truly devout temples of Uruk instead of going towards their own vanity? I think, I was thinking, we should permit the people of Arata to transport all of their gold and their jewels and their lapis lazuli down here, then we should kindly give them permission to skillfully fashion an absurdly opulent temple and palace complex. This would be much better than the current use of serving the empty vanity of Lord Arata, because instead it would glorify me, the divine Enmerkar, as well as, of course, you, Holy Ishtar. The people would marvel at the wealth that I possess, and even my father Shamash, who is the sun itself, would witness the splendor of this temple, and he would rejoice. Now Ishtar, who was at the time living in the city of Uruk, considered this proposition. And, he, and she smiled down at him from her palace, and, he, and she said, well, that sounds like a fantastic idea. We could build a fantastic palace that would have nice breezeways to keep it cool in the daytime. And we could have massive hallways that would impress all the illiterate mud-grubbing peasants who still live in these tiny sheds and huts that are all around the place. They would, be, they would walk in and their eyes would just be the size of moons and be like, whoa! whoa, what is going on here? Because, remember, we're still at the very dawn of civilization. These people, these people don't have our modern worldly experience. That's for sure. It would be huge, this palace, like a shining, bejeweled mountain. And all you have to do is find a messenger and have him tell Lord Arata that this is my will. And while we wait for him to get back to us, because these things will take a long time in these days. We can, uh, we can just sit here and draw up even more elaborate plans because surely this other king is going to be totally down for this. So Enmerkar calls out a messenger from his army, someone with good endurance and a good tongue, and he leans close to this messenger and he says, Listen now, I want you to head east. Go up the Zubi Mountains, and then head back down the other side. Go past the city of Susa and the city of Ansan until you get to Arata. Then I want you to walk into the palace of Lord Arata, and I want you to tell him that he is going to gather up all of his gold and his ore and his precious metals, and that he is going to pack them onto all of his donkeys. He's going to send them, along with all of his laborers and craftsmen, down to Uruk, and then He's going to build me a massive ziggurat that will be the size of a mountain. And it will be a massive, shining monument of me. Listen. Listen, now I know, I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, well, you know, I'd be happy if you pay me current market rate for all of these things. But you will tell him, you will tell him that if he does not do this, I will drive the people from his city like scattering birds. His market rate will be the dust of an utterly destroyed city. Tell him this too, tell him this, that just in the same way as humanity is the predator over all the wolves and lions and snakes of the world, so too is Enmerkar the predator over humanity. And tell him this too, tell him there was a time when all men shared the same language under the mightiest of gods and the mightiest of kings, 
and they all labored to construct the most incredible monuments, ziggurats that reached the skies, that made the very heavens jealous. Those days of unity are coming again, and those mountains of gold are going to be erected again for Enmerkar's glory. And so the messenger went to the town of Arata, guided each morning by Enmerkar's father, Shamash the son. And he went into the king's palace after all the requisite showing off and boasting, since, as you will see, Bronze Age kings love nothing more than swinging their dicks around. And he repeated Enmerkar's message. The clay tablet helpfully repeats the entire thing for us in case we forgot, but since it was literally the paragraph before this one, we could skip ahead to Lord Arata's response. Lord Arata looks at the messenger and says, Tell your king this. Tell him, who is it? Who is it between the two of us that Blessed Lady Ishtar has seen fit to endow with massive, hulking mineral reserves and thick, meaty veins of gold in his land? Who is it that gains Lady Ishtar's favor with his rock-hard gemstone? and his long, deep, penetrating minds of lapis lazuli? Who is it that can please Lady Ishtar by his erection of huge, gem-studded monuments that push deep into the heavens? No messenger, you let Lord Uruk know that his faith is flaccid and hollow, and that Arata is far too dominant to submit to Uruk. The messenger, he replied, Well, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable, oh, mighty lord, but I'm afraid I have to tell you that if you have emptied your bedchamber for Lady Ishtar, she resides as holy queen in the palace at Uruk. It is she herself who has said that Arata shall bend over and bow in submission. I heard it from her very lips in the majestic brick city of Uruk. The literal, physical indwelling of the patron goddess Ishtar in the city of Uruk must not have been common knowledge. I mean, it seems pretty unbelievable, but apparently 100% true, because when Arata heard this, he fell into a troubled silence. Like he was seriously, seriously put out by this. He's staring at his feet in search of an answer. And he's scratching his head, and he's pacing around the throne room, and it puts on a show. But then finally, he thinks of it. He cries out, and he even bellows his answer out. He says, listen here, you little prick. Ishtar made these mountains. They are impenetrable. You can march your pathetic army into these mountains and you will be snared by them like the talons of the Anzu bird. And the blood of my enemies will run down these bright mountains. We will weep for your dead and offer them burial after you have been driven back. But if your king wants a contest, then I'll give him one. As the proverb says, the bull who ignores his rival cannot have his share of grain. But the bull that drives off his rival gets to eat for two. So come, Lord of Uruk, bring your five or ten soldiers and face me. I was getting bored. But if his words are true, if they are not merely arrogant bluster, if you really are, Lord Uruk, favored by Lady Ishtar, then surely you can prove that favor. Surely, the blessings of Ishtar would allow you to load every donkey in your city with every net and pouch and fill them all with barley and send them here. Then Ishtar herself can come leading this convoy in all of her divine glory, dancing the entire way up, and then announce to me herself that she has forsaken Arata for Uruk. And you know, if he does this, then I will gladly acknowledge King Enmakar as the favorite of the gods. Now, there being no Skype, no cell phones, 
no instant messenger back in these days, Lord Arata forced the very much non-instant messenger to memorize this statement exactly as he said it, down to the bellowing. And he sent this messenger back to the city of Uruk. And when he gets there, the go-between apparently gave a really good performance, imitating perfectly Arata's bellowing in Enmerkar's own hall, while the mighty king listened, listened patiently. And I guess this was, this was entertainment before you had Netflix. Or I guess entertainment before you had podcasts about ancient stories. But finally, at the end of the story, Enmerkar turns to the advisor on his left, and he says, Does Arata really understand the implications of what he's just said? And so the next morning, Enmerkar went out and performed a sacred ritual that is described in agonizing detail. Basically, he gets the waters from the Tigris River and the waters from the Euphrates River. He mixes them both into a bowl, and then he does magic on the water before finally opening the doors of the royal granary. He personally measured out the first cup of barley in a very careful ritual into the first sack of grain. Then he turned around and made his servants do all the rest of the loading and went back to the palace. And they loaded all the grain onto all the donkeys in the city. And a massive convoy of men and donkeys and food started walking towards Arata. And at the head of the convoy, Enmakar sent his royal scepter that carried the power and blessing of Ishtar. Now, when the convoy arrived, it happened to be a bad harvest time for the city of Arata, and everyone in the town knew exactly who it was that had sent the grain, and had heard the stories of Uruk being blessed by Ishtar. Now, this was a great situation for people who wanted to eat, but a terrible situation for someone who wanted to keep being king of Arata. This messenger, our friend, the previous messenger, came up to him after a while and said that, look, Enmerkar kept his side of the deal, so it is time for Arata to send a whole bunch of shiny rocks. But Arata still refuses and complains that the royal scepter Enmerkar sent is just not ornate enough to convince him of its divinity. And he sends the messenger back. And then Makar looks at the return scepter and says, Well, you know, you know, I am king over the greatest city of the dawn of human civilization. And I'm not really doing anything being king all day. So maybe I can do better than this. And so he takes a break from being king. Or maybe he stays being king, but no one cares that he spends all of his time making a new scepter and he spends 10 years carefully crafting the most ornate scepter you have ever seen in your life and it's got gems and gold inlay and of course it's got to have lapis lazuli whatever that is and at the end of this he sits there and he's just looking at it in awe of his own work and he gets it blessed by Ishtar in another very elaborate ritual that does not need to be repeated in modern times. And then he hands that scepter to the messenger and he says, Messenger, I want you to deliver this message exactly as I am saying it. And then he proceeds to further bluster and declaim about the merits of this scepter and the blessings of Ishtar enjoyed by the king of Uruk, which is all very repetitive again. And so the messenger returned again to Arata, who took one look at this scepter and said, Well, I can't argue with this. This is a fine scepter. But everyone knows, everyone knows that scepters aren't really signs of divine favor. It's, it's the result of personal combat that will show who the gods truly favor. You have him send his champion up here for a little battle. And I will acknowledge the results of that. Now, 
the actual speech was, as all of these have been much longer and more flowery, with many unnecessary praises of gods and kings, but still the messenger was able to memorize all of it and return to Uruk. Now Enmakar, who you would think would be a bit tired of all the back and forth by now, was delighted by the proposal. I guess everyone likes a good death match. He relayed a message to the messenger, first saying, yes, he would love to send a champion. The king then began to boast about how he was blessed by the gods. He spoke of his own wealth and power in elaborate terms. Then he discussed how thoroughly he planned on crushing the city of Arata, grinding the mountains themselves down to dust and selling the people into slavery. And when he was finished, he looked to the messenger and said, you got all that? The messenger, messenger hesitated and being very careful to speak properly to the king and God. He said, no, no, honestly, that was a bit long. And I have already memorized so many messages for you. I am seriously running out of space here. I want to do what I can for you, but I have been running back and forth for years now, and the king, a giant among men, gently clapped his hand on the messenger's shoulder in familiarity, silencing and humbling him. Here, said King Enmakar as he pulled out a clay tablet and scraping tool. The entire court looked on, curious as to what the king could be doing the throne room silent except for the sound of clay being scraped out. Finally, he passed the tablet down to the messenger and said, This is called writing. Now the entire court was amazed. No one had ever invented such a thing before. The messenger exclaimed, Wow, this is amazing. The clay remembers the words instead of the mind, such that even in the absence of the speaker, or long after the death of the speaker, his words can still reach the ears of men. My king, you have discovered immortality of thought and surely ushered in an unimaginable age of literary and cultural achievement. Ah, uh, the king humbly mumbled that it wasn't that great, it's just writing. But the messenger had already begun running, his body encumbered by clay, but his mind released to pursue higher thoughts. He reached Lord Arata and handed him the tablet. Now, even though writing had only just been invented, kings are apparently naturally literate. So he was able to both read the tablet and, at the same time, be astounded by the new invention of King Enmakar. At the same moment, as he read the tablet, the heavens split open and a precious rain fell into the land of Arata, blessing it with abundant food ending the famine that had caused Lord Arata to even consider bending the knee to Uruk. And he announced that the single combat would be taking place since clearly the gods had blessed Arata. The champions met in a battle that was so thrilling that the people were too busy watching it to write down on clay tablets what happened. All we know of the battle is that the champion of Uruk wore a white turban and lion skins, and that the champion of Arata was defeated. But when we rejoin our tale in the other tablet, we find that Arata is still unsatisfied and has sent a wizard down to Uruk to try and beat them. The wizard's first strategy is to go amongst the animals of Uruk and really try to unionize them. He spoke to the cows and the goats and he said, he said, cows, look, you make all this butter and milk and cheese, and then tell me, tell me, cow, where does all of the fruits of your own body go? And he's expecting, he's expecting a natural, oh, life is so hard, like you'd get from a normal slave in the city of Arata. But the cow, he says, oh, oh, you want to know where my butter goes? Well, let me tell you, let me tell you, my dairy products go to the god Nisaba. 
of grain. You go up, you go up to the temple of Nisaba and you look at that particular shrine with the onyx bull and you look down under it, that butter every Thursday, that's my butter. And the goat right next to him, he speaks up, he says, look, 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 did you know that my cheese gets sacrificed to Enlil, the god, the storm god? And, and sorcerer, he's like, well, yeah, I guess, I guess that does, that does sound pretty good. You're not, you're not even a little bit bitter, and all the animals say, no, no, we're not bitter, we love it. This is great. We are serving divinity. And thus, the very first attempt at domesticated unionism was defeated, and the sorcerer went back out to the river Euphrates to try and think of another plan. Now, his next plan was to do actual magic. I guess talking to animals, that's kind of magical. But now he's doing real magic. He is touching his finger to the water of the Euphrates and conjuring animals out of the river. Now, what is this accomplishing? How is he going to defeat the city of Uruk by conjuring animals out of the river? That's not really clear. But the wizards of Uruk had already figured out what he was doing. And as soon as he conjured an animal, the more powerful wizards of Uruk conjured the predator for that animal to eat the beast. The sorcerer of Arata was baffled until the wise woman of Uruk said to him, Can't you see that you are using the god's magic against the god's favorite city? This is never, ever going to work out for you. And the wizard, he's, well, I guess... I guess that must be right. So he packed his bags and he went home. And with this defeat, Lord Arata was forced to acknowledge the superiority of Uruk over Arata. He sent a message, presumably in this newfangled writing system, saying just how deeply humbled he was before the gods and how weak and inferior his people were. And so King Enmakar sends a little note that's only a little gloating, thanking the Lord Arata for finally seeing sense and asking, when are you going to deliver the requested mountain of gold and gems? Thus ends the royal epics of Enmerkar, second king of Urk. But though this second tablet ends on a happy note, we still have two sequels to this particular adventure, the two-tablet tale of Lugal Banda. But before we get to that, I want to discuss what really strikes me about this particular tale. First off, writing. Here we see the maybe mythic, maybe real invention of writing. But more than that, for these people, writing was a superpower. Do you want to convey your thoughts to someone you will never ever meet? You want to talk long distance? You want to talk to the dead? Talk to the future? Hear from the past? You can put your voice into a rock, and that rock will hold your thoughts for all eternity. And here we are. Here we are at the very dawn of writing. This story, remember, comes from maybe as early as 2,700 BCE. Writing, writing is new, and already they're coming from their old oral traditions that had dominated, you know, the hundred thousand years of pre-literate human history, and they've got writing. And now, almost 5,000 years later, we can look at their writing, and they're right. It is a superpower. Also, in this tale, we can see that they took their gods seriously in a way that even later religious peoples did not. Ishtar is literally considered to be living in that palace. It is proof for the messenger that he has seen Ishtar and he can tell Lord Arata, no, you can't sleep with her. She's banging the king of Uruk. And that's 
taken in a very literal sense in this story and in many other stories that we have seen or that I have seen and that we will get to in this podcast. And also we see a contrast between farming economies and mining economies here at the dawn of civilization. These are the first two really powerful kinds of settled civilization. But Uruk, the city of Uruk is estimated to have had between 50,000 and 80,000 people. That's many times bigger than the town I currently live in. And of course, all of that in a walled city. They were living in a massive agricultural plain and this huge well-fed population translates directly into wealth and power for the city. Whereas mining, mining is something that a powerful city can then go out and take, not a source for power itself. And finally, this tale where not much actually happens, it's just people talking to each other, but we are seeing the very earliest sophisticated diplomacy. We're seeing every method that an ancient leader has to negotiate with another leader. We see market exchange, or at least market exchange being proposed. We see a personal exchange of gifts in the scepters. We see just raw naked threats. We see invocations of the gods. Personal combat is on offer. Sabotage is attempted, and ultimately, warfare. This entire story is predicated on the use of force and no one at any point fails to recognize this. The entire thing is made possible because for the first time in history a city, Uruk, is able to project power all the way to Arata. But the precise balance of power, this is like three, four hundred miles of heavy mountain ranges, the precise balance of power is close enough that Arata believes the logistical challenge of reaching through the mountains will deplete the army enough to keep them safe. Now next time, we're going to see if that mountain range really is enough to keep the city of Arata safe. So I hope you join me as we move forward to the second part of the Royal Sumerian Epics with the tale of Lugal Banda. Thank you for listening.